I'd now like to introduce our final uh, moderator. An again, another data Ikua. This time, our director of content, Lynn Heidman. Hi, everyone, and thanks for sticking around for the last panel of the day. Um, my panelists will be joining me in just a few minutes. Um, we'll be diving into some of the key topics that are facing not only data science, but data scientists. Um, but first, I just want to take a quick look into the project that has inspired this panel. Um, and I'm proud to give you the very first sneak peek of a documentary um, that's upcoming by Luminante that explores the world of data science and probably more importantly, the people behind it. So let's take a look. I want to use my artificial intelligence to help humans live a better life. Data science is truly revolutionizing the world. Every engineer will have some exposure to data science, and therefore every consumer in the world will be interacting with something that has to do with machine learning. The potential to unlock so much information, to unlock so many new ways of exploring our world and doing better for our world. There's been a lot of issues where data science goes wrong. Facebook is a great example, the Cambridge Analytica stuff. We have revolutionized digital marketing, but what did the consumer get from that? You sort of only see the news that your friends and the people that you talk to a lot are interested in. Everyone just gets exactly their own echo chamber. And those echo chambers just get smarter and smarter, and they just keep serving us the same information. What are the blind spots? What are the big areas that we don't know? That's our role as data scientists, to ask those questions. We had just started scratching the surface of AI. People will realize that a lot of what has been promised is not yet possible. Computers have a hard time reasoning about events. They have a hard time telling what would have happened if something would have been different. If you're driving towards a cliff, you know if you drive over it, you're going to fall. And AI doesn't know that. It actually has to experience falling off this cliff. Whomever gets ahead in this race will definitely make better decisions. And whomever can make better decisions will always win. When there's $50 million to play, you've got to make sure to take the right decision at the right time. At last, with the big data era, social science finally found its telescope. We're suddenly able to look across huge geographical widths, huge depths of time. This is really what makes a huge impact on our business. And it was there all along, but we couldn't see it. We no longer have to rely on our personal experience. We can collect that collectively. What are the frontiers? So with that, please welcome our panelists up to the stage, uh, Trevini Gandhi, Miriam Ayadi, and Perry Beaumont. Welcome and thanks, thanks for being here today, to all three of you. Um, I think one of the biggest themes that, that we see in the documentary and that also we've seen just here today is this idea of, of being human-centered. So for you three um, as data scientists, what does it mean to be human-centered as a data scientist in your day-to-day -day work in the trenches? Well, actually, I think going back to what Brandeis was speaking about earlier, the sort of ethics and implications of what we do are really important. Um, and so actually centering humans in my work is how I try to stay human-centric. I, I would definitely echo that that's something very important. And to maybe extend on that a little bit, what we actually mean by saying that we're trying to be ethical uh, with data is that I think that there is certainly a part that is uh, numerate, but then another just as equally, if not in some senses, more important, uh, how we are literate about that as well. And that we have a particular obligation uh, in the context of numbers and data to help people to really understand what it's telling us, but maybe even more importantly, in some instances, what it, what it cannot tell us, what a number is not able to convey in terms of uh, human emotions and what it means for uh, the consequences of what the data might be used for. Um, in that sense, just as a quick uh, mention of one of the books and props to Data IQ for the selection that, that's available there, uh, a, a really excellent read in that respect is uh, a title, Weapons of Math Destruction, 
um, and really kind of gets into that whole theme of how there really is this obligation to help share and interpret uh, beyond what simply an analysis might suggest. Okay. I will touch upon maybe uh, it, the fun thing being a panel in the afternoon is that most of the, the thoughts are shared by other people, so other people did the job of uh, uh, filling us in, but the, the one I want to highlight for uh, the piece on human-centric is uh, the, the cool factor. Um, I do think ultimately um, the data science world is still the sort of hands-on techies versus the non-tech, and I'd love to talk about citizen data scientists later. Um, but I think, um, I think the cool factor sometimes is um, prioritized too much, where you forget ultimately um, that you would need to rather remember what is the question that we're trying to have the customer ultimately benefit from. So data science being, all things considered, a relatively new domain, there are obviously still misunderstandings about, about what you do and, and what exactly your job is. So what do you think that, that most people um, still misunderstand about, about data scientists? I mean, that we're all nerds who sit in front of a computer, right? We are nerds, okay. Um, um, but I'm a self-proclaimed nerd. But if I really just sat in front of a computer the whole day and wrote code, I would be a bad data scientist. And so you do have to get out there. You do talk to people. You talk to your, you know, your end users. You talk to your, the folks who are directing the, the business line or whatever it might be. Um, and that's a big part of guiding your understanding of what you're doing and what, uh, what you want to get out of your data science. I think that's an excellent point, and one other dimension to that might be, and you're certainly right in, in talking about the newness of, of data science. Um, having said that, I think it's also helpful to sometimes remember the, the history that we build our various ideas upon, and, and those have come before us uh, with, with some, in some ways, relative to today's capabilities, simple approaches, but very powerful approaches. So for example, we might think of Florence Nightingale, who in the late 1800s uh, developed a, a relatively basic hypothesis that if hospitals were maybe kept a little bit cleaner, uh, that that might lead to greater uh, ability of helping to save people's lives, collected some statistics, did some analyses, and revolutionized healthcare uh, as a result of some of her findings. Um, or another maybe more recent example, um, Big data is, is, is this very popular um, buzzword, buzz term. And sometimes I think the most elegant um, solutions to things can be uh, aspects of what involves what we might call small data. Um, I have a colleague, for example, who is trying to help identify ways uh, in some developing countries, uh, decision rules for helping to know when to extend credit for uh, a cell phone bill and found that just by collecting a couple of very simple data points, such as whether more phone calls were received rather than going out, suggesting that they had a community of, of, of friends and, 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 and the like, or if they were more involved with phone calls in urban areas versus rural areas, that that might have suggested more job opportunities, that on the basis of three data points, they were able to come up with a very meaningful model and then developed another cohort as well for more rural areas uh, uh, at, at the same time relative to, to urban centers. So I think some of those reminders can be very powerful for us as well. What about you, Miriam? Do you think that people misunderstand your, your role as a data scientist? Yeah, so I actually want to build upon the idea of, uh, of big data. I was thinking about this a lot, and I think sometimes when you hear data science, people automatically equate it to big data. That's probably what they do uh, all the time. Um, just a reminder that um, we look at all sorts of data, small as well as big, but also maybe a slight misconception is more data does help, and of course there's models that actually can only work when you have massive amounts of data and would not work otherwise. Uh, but more data doesn't necessarily mean more accuracy, and I think people forget that. If we give them, we've been collecting things for 10 years or et cetera, it must be enough. I think people, there's sometimes a misconception with uh, accuracy. It does help, but it always depends on the nature of the problem itself. Some problems will have certain limitations, whatever model you're uh, building on it. 
I think what's interesting is each and every one of you in some way mentioned uh, the fact of, of working with business teams, that it's not just you and data all, all the time. So what's something that, that you do already or you think we can do to sort of bridge that gap between those two types of people and the way they look at problems and, um, and the way that they work together? Yeah, I mean, I think collaboration is key, right? So being able to, not only able, but willing to sit down at the table with these folks. I think sometimes, you know, on both sides, people might think, okay, those guys are a little too, too eggy. I'm not gonna be able to understand what they're trying to say. Egg, sorry. <laughs> they're a little too, too nerdy. <laughs> um, won't be able to understand what they're trying to say. And, the, you know, the data scientists might say, well, these guys just want money and drive the power and what, you know. And so I think recognizing that there's common goals, right, um, around the table and being willing to uh, hear each other out and, you know, push boundaries on both sides. I'm a believer in um, sort of dissolving the divide between techie and non-techie. So what, who decides do you have enough requirements in order to become a data scientist? And I think that in and of itself will help um, make the discussion with business users or whatever the other represents. Uh, for example, I, and I know different people agree and disagree, uh, for, I don't know if people have heard of AutoML out there. Um, so there's a, a bunch of companies these days that work on what is called automated machine learning, and it's basically a bunch of models that you would normally work on um, are already implemented, and you give it at this point, very structured, ready to go data as its input, and then it'll and or use the pre-built models and give you various uh, uh, explanations about it and then the best model that it thinks uh, you should go with. Uh, I'm a believer that those kind of tools should also be given to business people because it depends how data structure is, or data science is structured within your company. Uh, maybe your data scientists are awesome and know exactly what your business is and maybe even have a background in it, but generally the person that has been doing the job on the sort of non-tech side knows a lot more and I, I don't see why they shouldn't play around. I do believe, and that's a further discussion, that um, any tool that you give to anybody um, can be problematic if you're not uh, kind of providing the structure around it. So some basic statistics or, um, like I love the example of if you have a, um, a, an unbalanced type of data where, for example, like cancer type of example, and you're trying to pick up when it's, um, when it's not benign, and maybe that's 1% of the data that you have is the not benign uh, examples, then if your model is giving you 90%, that sounds high, but actually that's worse than a cost of a toy because you will often get the, um, the non-cancerous examples. Um, so things like that, just uh, having some background but still pushing in the tools to the non-techies, that's personally what I'm a believer of. Well, and it sounds like there's terminology that has to change around this, right? So, you know, I have worked with people who are like, oh, well, you're, you're the genius. You know the stuff, you whatever. But no, actually, you know a lot about your subject area, right? You understand what this data means, um, even if you don't know how to code it up in like some pretty visualization. And so I think recognizing that we all work with data, right? And we all use data, um, but maybe how we use it is a little bit different. That doesn't have to divide us, as you say, uh, and it can be something that unites us. I think one of the, the, the best thing that data scientists can do is talk with a lot of other people who are not data scientists. Yes, we, and we, we have to do that. And, and, and we learn so much when we make the effort to do that. And, and not just in a context, I, I would say, of, of other colleagues and the like, but, but things that we choose to read and, and, and things that we try to stay current with, yes, within our particular domains and industries and what have you, but looking to others as well and trying to learn from what, what's happening there. And this idea of what's coming to be called, in, in some respects, um, XAI or explainable AI, extremely important. There, there's no reason at all why the kinds of things that we do should be almost like speaking in a, in a, in a special code. Um, we, we should be making tremendous efforts to try to educate and share and have that be a big part of the conversation of what we do to help others really understand where it's coming from 
And I think what that also maybe speaks to is that if you have a solution and you basically get the similar results, but one's kind of complex and cool in the latest model, but you have something that's also fairly simple that others can maybe try to replicate and, and, and really have use of, go with the simple one. Agreed. <laughs> have, have it, make it something that all can really benefit of and come up with their own ideas. Yeah. Just to touch upon that, because it's an important one, the explainable AI. Uh, for people on the more, we just talked about tech or non-tech, for people that are looking into this, um, Shop in Lime is something worth looking into. It's sort of what's out there right now in the papers world uh, in terms of uh, explainability and the, the what's happened. So obviously, uh, and I think there's a lot of discussions, if you can go with a simpler model, which sometimes is called a white box model, then go with that because by nature and statistically, um, it's things that we understand more. You get coefficients back. You can look at it and, and, and say in English terms uh, what it means. Uh, but for these other techniques, um, now we've gotten to a time where black box models, so including deep learning, et cetera, um, you get to look at the input data and sort of, say, shuffle it around um, and see how are my outputs changing. Um, so we're, we're getting there, but again, those things do have limitations, so I don't want to oversell it, but worth looking into, and they do work for the black box types of models. It, it sounds also, again, like we're trying to sort of democratize data, right? Like, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and be like, I, I only speak math, right? Um, and the person on the other end is like, I, I can't understand what you're saying, right? I actually, as a data scientist, take it upon myself to try and make sure that other folks who are not data scientists are picking up what I'm saying, right? And I try to make it in plain English, you know, and be able to actually have a conversation and not like, you know, a brick wall of, code in between. Yeah. Um, and I think that sort of opening up um, both sort of in how we as data scientists talk to others and how we as data scientists choose the right model, the one that is a little bit clearer, the one that is something that we can actually talk about um, is really, really important. Yeah, so it sounds like the onus is really on both sides to kind of come and meet halfway in the middle. Um, and we talked a little bit about already what other people misunderstand about your role, but is there anything that you think other data scientists misunderstand about what data scientists should be doing or, or, uh, or what they could be doing? Uh, I would say for my part that a big part of it would be related to um, being open to where other ideas might be coming from and that they do not all have to have uh, a beginning, middle, and end in terms of, of data or, or, or models and, and the like and to be open to where ideas might come from. Um, in, in science and physics, there's this law of thermodynamics which says that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it simply moves to, to other places. And I think that that's a really interesting concept in the context of the kind of work that, that we do. That, for example, when the retail store outlet was thought to be on, on the downfall because of uh, Amazon and deliverable packages and the like, the idea of, okay, well, the role for insurance uh, with, with slips and falls in front of stores and what have you is just going to disappear and there won't be any other opportunities. But actually what bubbled up as a new area to think about was ensuring packages arriving on time and, and undamaged and what have you. It's simply that energy emerged in a different way, in a different fashion. Um, or we think about driverless cars. Today, cars are driven by people with emotions who are many times making so many decisions all at once. We're driving down a road. It might be a heavy rain. Uh, an animal just jumps in front of us. We see in a rearview mirror that there's a car very close to us. If we hit the brakes, there might be something with that as well. All of that potentially could be replaced with a line of computer code who will take in the various decision points being digested by the online computer and decide that what's going to be done is X. But is that really what we would want to have be done? Are we really helping others to realize the kind of decisions that are increasingly being made for them and that they can challenge that, they should challenge that, and it's okay to push back and, and to really embrace more of that and for coming full circle to your question about the data science community, to let them do that. <laughs> let them have that, that voice and, and make what we do stronger and better because we're recognizing that there are human elements to what we do that are, that are so crucially important. I almost want to build up on uh, the, uh, I guess, car examples, and it's um, if you're working on automated cars, 
you're probably collecting data to train on it. Maybe you collect a ton of data, hills, everything. But if you only collected daytime data, then your car is not gonna be able to drive at night. And just like we consider those types of things, um, I'd like to bring up the idea of bias again, and I'm glad it was talked about here. And I think, I think we're at a stage where the data scientists are talking about bias, um, but I have this analogy where um, I feel like bias, because I come from a software engineering background, is like testing. Like, no offense to any uh, industry, I think uh, everyone does it differently, but in software engineering, you, you're supposed to write code, and then before it goes to production, you're supposed to spend a good chunk amount of time to test it. But very often, you have, uh, uh, maybe you were supposed to test for three days, but it's sort of that very last thing that you think about, and I think bias is at that stage where we're starting to have the conversations about it, um, but I think the world of data science needs to embed it even more and be very serious about adding it in curriculum, for instance. Um, one example, how many people are familiar with uh, word embeddings? Okay, maybe like a, a fifth of the room. Um, it's an interesting example. Um, it's the name of a paper. Um, so word embeddings, and I'll get to the name of the paper in a moment. Um, say you take the word men, and you put it out there in, in a space, a semantic space. Um, and this is a popular example for uh, people in data science, but I'll build upon it. Um, so men is to king, so take the word king and put it up there in space as women. And if you draw the same direction semantically, you're gonna get man is to king like woman is to queen. That's the popular example out there. You could do it the same with cities. So Tokyo is to Japan like Washington DC is to the United States. The title of the, the, the paper is man is to computer scientist as woman is to homemaker. Um, but the reason I bring this up is the good thing is this paper talks about unbiasing the world that we exist in. And I like the way they phrase it. They say, amplifying biases present um, in the world we live in. So in other words, knowing that these things, so this word embedding gets um, created based on various news out there. Uh, and nevertheless, we ended up with these conclusions. Um, but really here, um, it just reminds me that that exists knowing that just like when thinking of examples like driverless cars, we need to embed it in trainings to be more serious about that exists, that's the world we live in, how do I um, amplify and, um, or let's say supplement my data so that I can think of the world more holistically and I don't fall into those examples? I think, yeah, you know, it's not about, sorry, let me rewind that sentence. So. Um, I think the point is that as data scientists, we have to understand that we have a responsibility to not only the best model and the like fastest runtime and whatever, but also making sure what we're doing is um, equitable and fair, right? And so does it mean that we're making sure that when we get a set of data, oh wait, wow, there are no women in this data set, that makes no sense. Um, or this data set is heavily skewed towards one race um, and that's going to change our ultimate algorithm, whatever it is, and actually building in that mindfulness from the beginning of the project um, all the way through, I think is really important. So, you know, you, you make a good point that this conversation is coming up more and more, but I hope that we can start moving the needle towards action on that, right? Because how many, how many talks, how many panels, you know, how many of these do we need to have uh, before we, we move the needle? Yeah, definitely. Perry, just something to add? Um, yeah, and I think all these comments are really great. One of the th things in terms of what's really nice about being able to do certain things with data is when you can 
see that they fall into nice cohorts to, to look at in a study and, that, and to really try to resist the temptation to force something into a cohort or a particular bucket if it really doesn't deserve to be there. Um, and to step back from what might allow for a greater ease of analysis and, and understanding uh, when you're going to compromise diversity and individuality uh, of, of particular contexts. Um, so, for example, um, we, we can go to uh, an online um, bookseller and on the checkout page we can um, be informed that people who purchased this book also purchased these titles. I would love to know that um, who wouldn't go near the title that I just purchased so I can learn something about what they have an interest in. What, what's the other side of the views of things that I like to read about and know about so I can be better informed? And I think that data can have a role to play in that particular context. It doesn't have to be necessarily about reinforcing or even um, pushing more towards conformity and, 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 and things that can help to create divisions. There are some, I think, creative ways that data can, can be used to help bubble up and enrich things that are also different about us and to help to us to find ways to learn more about things that are different from us. Yeah, um, so I think today, just through all the talks that we've seen, we've kind of ping-ponged back and forth between AI is good, AI is, is, is bad. Um, so. I want to focus on the positive because that's a, a bit of an optimist, but what do you all think is kind of the biggest reward that could came, come out of, of AI in the future? I don't, I think the reward is whatever we want it to be, but it will only come if we use AI as a tool and not as an end all be all, right? And so, right, EGG is the human centric conference and I'm a human centric data scientist and our AI needs to be human centric, right? If at the end of the day, you know, we're not taking that AI and using it as another tool in our toolbox or as another implementation of something else, um, we're doing ourselves a disservice, right? The best way for us to be able to uh, make use of AI and get whatever that reward might be, you know, I would love a million dollars from AI if that could happen, sure. Um, the best way is for us to acknowledge that this is still, this is still, you know, math at the end of the day, right? Maybe there's some neural networks going on. That neural network is still math. Um, and if we turn it over and say, look, the AI has done it, and it's like thinking on its own, we are letting ourselves be blinded by sort of like, what's the term I'm looking for? You know, like the shiny newness of AI and not saying that, no, this is just something that we can use to better ourselves. Yeah, and one example of that I, I highly, highly respect. Um, this uh, nonprofit called DataKind. If you haven't heard of them, look them up. I'm seeing a thumbs up from somewhere in the crowds. Thanks. Uh, I, I'm not affiliated with DataKind, but um, basically they uh, they work with organizations and pair them up with pro bono data scientists to work on a bunch of variety of humanitarian type of use cases. So to be more specific of examples where um, AI is being used positively, be it with the um, deep learning, CNNs, actually, especially, so the, the world of like image recognition type of stuff is, is so popular these days and effective. Um, there's one example um, where they were looking at developing countries and taking satellite imagery shots, um, and you could sort of see patches of um, like little squares. And it turned out that um, some of them were shinier than others, uh, to simplify things. Um, and when you looked closer, the houses that were shiny, like a silver roof, represented houses that were made of metal roofs compared to other ones that were made of thatched roofs. And based on that, what the team at DataKind did is uh, calculate a proportion of the metal roofs and that would help you determine uh, if certain villages um, were in more urgent financial need. Um, so again, I just, it's just fascinating. I'm personally also looking at satellite imagery in a different sense to, to provide tools to supplement uh, the work of economists in developing worlds. Um, again, it's out there. Believe it or not, satellite imagery is available for free, by the way. If anyone needs a reference or a link, happy to share that. Uh, but again, so that's where I think we finally have the tools to tackle some problems uh, and they can definitely be positive. Yeah. Where, where I would be really hopeful is with the idea that um, in the near future that um, 
anyone who would really like to be more comfortable and, and numerate um, can have the resources available to do that. Um, if we were to go back in time to um, the discovery of electricity and what have you, and all the great ideas that came out of new types of businesses and the telegraph and, and what have you uh, that could leverage that particular technology, today we don't say, let's build a business plan around this concept of electricity. We take it for granted. It's, it's, it's among us. We use it. We know it's available as a resource, as an idea. And to be able to have that uh, down the road where it could be something that we can kind of just almost take for granted the idea that we, we have those resources, those abilities to, to look at those particular types of things that can help us to make better decisions in all areas, not just necessarily uh, banking, insurance, but, but medicine and, and all the things that can be uh, make a material difference in our quality of life and, and meaning of life um, would be, I think, something that would be really cool if, if that were to evolve to that point. Yeah, and just a sort of a nice tie-in for, for later today, we will have some AI for Good sessions coming up after our break, after the session, so make sure to stick around um, because, uh, to, to your point, that's kind of where the, the hope in, in AI really shines. Um, so normally when, when asking sort of where do you see yourself in five, five years, five years is kind of the, the standard, um, but I think for data science it's moving so quickly that it really has to be more like two years. So what do you guys see happening in data science or with data science in the next two years? Definitely that push towards interpretability, right? So Shapley, Lime, these things that allow us to understand what's in, inside of our models. But I've recently started delving into um, this idea of machine behaviorism, right? And so what are the n most numerous black boxes that we deal with on a da daily basis? Humans, right? And so as a person with a background in social science, um, I can see us moving to a world where we start treating our models like humans and saying, okay, I really don't know what's going on inside of that head of yours. Let's do some social science experimentations and let's find out. Um, and I think that approach can be really novel and more than novel, really useful because not only will it open up the box for us, we don't really have to reinvent the wheel. You know, social scientists and political scientists, we, we've got that all sorted out for you, right? And so I hope, I hope to see it go that way. Um, for me, I think uh, since two years is, is, is short but kind of long, uh, is AutoML. I personally just, uh, I just think it's growing in the industry and I'm very curious to see who's going to actually be the people using it the most. Um, I think it's fascinating. I talk to people from companies that do produce AutoML software and, and, and it's very rich. So it's there for all levels, and I'm just very curious to see uh, what even the data scientist job or role is going to be now that these tools are out there. For my part, I think what could very quickly happen within the two years, and it's certainly beginning to happen now, is that in a lot of instances where there are presently silos of development of ideas and coding and, and, and solutions and what have you, um, not only within firms, uh, particularly larger firms, but then across firms as well, uh, that there will be an increased amount of sharing because the ability to come up with the next algorithm for a faster, better solution that might be an industry could really be very helpful in, in, in nonprofit as well, or the things that are being done to try to help solve problems in the financial markets could be applied to agriculture as well. And while one of the things that I think that we should all feel collectively very proud about in the context of data in the sense of open source and that whole community of let's share, let's learn from each other's mistakes, let's, let's benefit from what someone else did coming before us is something that will, I think, explode even more and not just in some of the, uh, the narrower areas such as um, the coding piece, um, but also uh, for insights pertaining to uh, image recognition and the like or sensory related work and integrating that work um, in, a, in, a, in a way that's collaborative. Yeah, and just one more thing, uh, not to beat a dead horse, but um, oh, Rob, it started raining. Um, so the, I, I hope that in the future or in two years time, we have actually started moving towards more um, ethical, more inclusive data science, right? I, you know, I hope that in two years time, me coming up here and saying this, Brandeis' talk is redundant and unnecessary. So I think we have such responsibility and we have so much power, we should just do it. We should get out there, we should start building these systems um, in more equal and fair ways um, and actually let us control the future of AI and not let 
it be the other way around. So I think, unfortunately, I have so many more questions, but I think that's all we have, we have time for. So thank you to the panelists. And um, like I mentioned, make sure to stick around after our break for everyone to not only see the AI for Good and sort of the, um, the quick fire presentations that they will, they will present, but also for our uh, afternoon keynote, Nicholas Thompson, the editor-in-chief of Wired. Um, and with that, uh, the break will occur in, in the nest. And um, thank you again to our panelists.